What is going on, guys? Thank you so very much for stopping by the channel again today. I got a little bit of extra for you. It is October 26th, 2021. I am JD from New York, and this is Off The Script. Follow me on social media, at JD from NY206. That's on Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for all notifications. And if you guys missed any of the content on the channel, including last night's great Monday Night Raw post-show live stream, everything you need is listed on the homepage for you. So make sure you guys go and check all of that out. And please hit that thumbs up. Let's try for 1,500 thumbs up on today's Off The Script Extra. Tony Nese. Everybody's wondering what is the status of Tony Nese as we saw him in the crowd during AEW Dynamite on Saturday night. Tony Nese is now a part of All Elite Wrestling. Former Cruiserweight champion Tony Nese has reportedly signed with AEW, according to Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Live. It's not clear whether Nice has signed a quote-unquote Tier 0 contract or a Tier 1 contract with AEW. Now, if you guys don't know the difference, Cody Rhodes actually went over the differences between the two. A Tier 0 contract in AEW is where a talent is paid per appearance and a Tier 1 contract is a base contract for a performer. AW EVP Cody Rhodes explained this tier system a while back. Now, Rhodes explained that AEW does not give everyone an all elite graphic, and talents that get graphics are typically on the tier one or above contract. Nice was released by WWE last summer. He made an appearance in the crowd on Dynamite and is slated to debut on AEW Dark. Melcher reported that Nice has signed with AEW, but AEW has not indicated anything official as of right now. Maybe. Maybe AEW is waiting for the dark appearances to actually air and then give him an AEW graphic. That could be one thing. AEW really could be bringing him in per appearance as detailed in the Tier 0 contract. I didn't really think Tony Nese was going to end up in AEW, to be perfectly honest with you. I thought Tony Nese, and I don't usually say this all the time, everybody jumps to conclusions, oh, they'd be great in AEW, and then kind of neglect all the other promotions that are still, you know, doing their thing and thriving now, being that pro wrestling is back in front of live audiences. I honestly thought Tony Nese and Buddy Matthews, a.k.a. Buddy Murphy, even Braun Strowman, I thought all three guys would have fit like a glove in Impact Wrestling. I really do. Tony Nese would have been a great addition to the X Division. So would Buddy Matthews. I would actually say Buddy Matthews is good enough for a world championship run in Impact Wrestling. But Tony Nese in AEW, I get that he's a great talent. Tony Nese is incredible in the ring. He's got an incredible look. He's not going to be a needle mover by any means. But I don't think Tony Nese is going to really find his footing, especially early on in AEW. I feel like, and I don't want to say anything negative about AEW because I've thoroughly been enjoying the product, but I am very real. If they do something bad or, or something wrong, I will call them out on it. If they do something good, I will praise them for it. I've been the same way with AEW and WWE. I am a realist. But I do feel like AEW's roster is getting a little bit bloated. Is it going to be a proper destination? Is it going to be a right destination for guys like Tony Nese to come on in to AEW and really find success? It may take a while. With every new incoming talent, somebody else is being moved down on the totem pole. At some point, it's going to have to stop. At some point, Tony Khan is going to have to work with what he has and build with what he's built. We still have Wyndham Rotunda out there. He's still a major player out there in free agency. I don't know what's going to happen. 
with the roster. I don't know what AEW's roster as far as contracts and, you know, payroll is looking like. Uh, it's none of our business. The only one that should know that and the only one that does know that detail by detail is Tony Khan. For all we know, some of those contracts that were given to people in year one may be expiring and Tony Khan may not be renegotiating with those year one talents. We don't know. In hopes to make room for somebody like a Tony Nese and a Wyndham Rotunda and a Buddy Matthews and anybody else that they want to go out there and bring on into the company. Tony Nese is a great talent. I just don't think he's going to find his footing right away in AEW. And I honestly do think a guy like that, as talented as he is, is going to get lost in the shuffle. So we'll see what happens. Tony Nese apparently is with AEW. We don't know if it's a tier zero or a tier one contract. I'm glad he found work. He would be a welcome addition to anybody's roster. But I do think he probably would have fit better and found more opportunity in Impact Wrestling. Chad Gable. Speaking of contracts, this is somebody that I do think AEW is definitely going to take a look at when the time is right. Friends of Chad Gable are reportedly telling him and urging him to leave WWE. Now, there's always been praise by fans and internally in WWE about Chad Gable and his in-ring work, but it's been clear for a long time that management doesn't see him as being more than just a mid-card guy in a tag team with Otis, a part of the Alpha Academy. Gable's matches in NXT when he was a part of American Alpha with Jason Jordan were some of the best matches in NXT history, but he hasn't gotten the same opportunities on the main roster, and there are some that feel he should go elsewhere. During Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Meltzer praised Gable's in-ring work and said that there are people who have suggested for him to go elsewhere when his contract expires, but it does not look like he has any plans of leaving. Melcher said, and I quote, Chad Gable is fantastic. He's so fantastic, and they do nothing with him. He's one of those guys where I would go, God, get out of there. But you know, it's been talked about, but I don't think it's going to happen. It has been talked about, and he's definitely the type of guy that has friends telling him the same thing, and I know it's been one of those things that's been under consideration, but I don't think he's going anywhere, says Meltzer, end quote. Meltzer also noted that Gable's making a lot of money and that not everyone is going to get an offer from AEW. Listen, man, not everybody can end up in AEW. Tony Khan's not going to sign everybody. Chad Gable, for years, it's been spoken of in the IWC that the guy has the makings of the next Kurt Angle, but WWE has their next Kurt Angle lined up in Gable Stevenson. Chad Gable is one of the most misused talents in all of WWE. In, in fact, American Alpha was one of the best tag teams of the modern era. The makeup of American Alpha was one of the best tag teams in the modern era of WWE, and they broke them up before they even had a chance to take a sip of coffee. I didn't like that. Gable went on to go team with Shelton Benjamin, if you guys remember that. Jason Jordan went on to have a singles run. They complemented each other so well. I honestly think it's ingrained in WWE's mind to break up tag teams before they even get going. Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin, as of late, split up. Enzo and Cass split up. Terrible move. Absolutely terrible move. They wanted to break up the Street Profits in this year's draft. Thank God somebody said no. Now you got Gable back in a tag team when he was already a part of a tag team. Otis, he lost his tag team partner in Heavy Machinery. They break up fucking tag teams as a hobby in WWE. There are two guys that should be finding success in WWE. The makeup of Gable and Otis is very good. It's not American Alpha. It's not Heavy Machinery. But I do think they complement each other because I do believe they are real-life best friends. But they're going nowhere. Chad Gable had a great run in the King of the Ring two years ago. He had a great King of the Ring two years ago. He was in the finals with Baron Corbin. He brought Baron Corbin to the best match of his life in that King of the Ring. 
They had every opportunity to push this guy as an underdog babyface, as a Kurt Angle-like Olympian, and they didn't do it. They took him out of that tournament and made him into Shorty G. Because that's exactly WWE's mentality when it comes to guys the size of Chad Gable. Comedy and everything else that he possesses as far as sheer talent gets moved to the side. Guy is an unbelievable in-ring performer. I could watch Chad Gable wrestle all day long. And he's doing nothing in WWE. But who are we to say? We're looking on from a fan's perspective. From the outside looking in. If Gable's making money and he's supporting his family and it's too good to turn down. Who the fuck are we to tell Chad Gable to leave WWE? But at the end of the day, it always comes around again to them to bite them in the ass. Every one of these guys, whether they will admit it or not, same thing is happening right now with Kevin Owens. You think Kevin Owens wants to be stuck in fucking mid-card purgatory in WWE? It always comes back around, and when they do eventually leave, it always finds its way out into the open. They want to be a professional wrestler. Money will only make you so happy for so long. Every one of these men and women wants to wrestle. They want to be a professional wrestler. They want their creative freedom back. That's what they want. Chad Gable doesn't have any of that. He can make his money now. Maybe that's what he's doing. He's young enough to make his money now and continue to make his money. And then when he feels it's right, then he's going to go on and be a professional wrestler. Right now in WWE, he isn't really doing much of the professional wrestling side of things. He's just there, and WWE doesn't really give a shit what happens to Gable, Otis, or the Alpha Academy, which is sad. I wish tag team wrestling was a little bit better on the main roster, but I am not holding my breath for that to right itself in the coming months, especially after the draft. Chad Gable leaving WWE, I'd like to see it, but I don't really think we should be having this discussion right now about him leaving. And Meltzer is kind of in the know with what's going on because FTR has been very vocal. Cash and Dax have been very vocal about Gable leaving the WWE, and Meltzer would know. And if he says he doesn't see it happening, I kind of believe Dave Meltzer on it not happening for Chad Gable right now, jumping ship from the E to AEW. SummerSlam. Summer Scam has been announced for July of 2022, not August. In Nashville, more dates have been announced. WrestleMania. And the full pay-per-view schedule for 2022 has been announced by WWE. They issued a press release yesterday for their 2022 pay-per-view schedule. Some notable dates include Saturday and Sunday, April 2nd and 3rd for WrestleMania and SummerSlam will take place on July 2nd. As of yet, there is no word on the rumored UK pay-per-view, but some sources are indicating that the UK pay-per-view will actually take place in September of 2022. It's also noted that Labor Day weekend will occupy a WWE pay-per-view, and we all know that AEW usually does all out. On Labor Day weekend, but I'm assuming that WWE is under the impression that AEW is not competition, right? Yes, I'm sure that was just a fucking coincidence that you put a pay-per-view on Labor Day weekend. I was always told, personally, that Vince McMahon found Labor Day weekend to be a slow business weekend. So why is all of a sudden the WWE mentality changed on that? Oh, that's right. AEW is not competition. Bullshit. Bullshit. The 2022 schedule is as follows, and it does not include Saudi Arabia shows, but I think just by process of elimination, we know where those pay-per-views and those crown jewel shows or super showdown shows are going to fit into the calendar. Day one, January 1, that will take place in Atlanta. Then we got the Royal Rumble from St. Louis on January 29th. There is no February pay-per-view. So WWE may be eliminating the Elimination Chamber, or we may get the Chamber at Crown Jewel in February, or whatever the fucking show is called, in February. So WWE is leaving February wide open right now, so I'm assuming they're going to Saudi 
in February, which would probably be about the second or third week in February, which would leave the entire last week of February, all of March, five or six weeks to build for WrestleMania, which is the way it should be. WrestleMania is once again a two-night event, April 2nd and April 3rd. Thank God, I think that is the best way to go about it. Plus, for our content creation, I think it's best as well because it's double the revenue for double the biggest show of the year. May 8th, we're getting a pay-per-view that is unannounced right now. It says it will take place in Providence, Rhode Island. I don't know what that's going to be. Hopefully, WWE slowly eliminates these themed gimmick pay-per-views. June 5th, All-State Arena in Chicago. July 2nd, Money in the Bank at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas. So 40 to 45,000 large in Las Vegas for Money in the Bank. Going to be a big deal. WWE is actually doing Money in the Bank on July 2nd and SummerSlam July 30th from Nissan Stadium in Nashville, Tennessee. So we're getting two major stadium shows in the same month. Going to be a big summer for WWE. I am of the old school mind. I would get rid of the Money in the Bank pay-per-view. I would bring back the King of the Ring and do a King of the Ring pay-per-view. I would actually move Money in the Bank to a WrestleMania show on either April 2nd or April 3rd. That's what I would do. I want to get rid of all the gimmick pay-per-views, but that's just me. Maybe you guys feel the same way. I do think that it should go back to its original home at WrestleMania and get rid of the gimmick pay-per-view. SummerSlam, July 30th. September 3rd or September 4th, Labor Day weekend, pay-per-view to be announced. It may actually take place in the United Kingdom. That is still being worked out. And then November 26th, Survivor Series will take place at the TD Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Most of these shows outside of the May 8th one and Sunday, April 3rd, are all Saturday shows, which I don't really care either way. Maybe you guys care. I don't care either way. I work from home. Maybe you guys like it a little bit better because some of these shows go late and you got to be up for work the next morning. I honestly think Saturday pay-per-views are a lot better. I do think that it's easier on all of us. It kind of messes with my schedule because I usually upload the podcast on Saturday, but I don't really take that to be a major deal. Saturday pay-per-views are where it's at, and I can absolutely get used to Saturday pay-per-views because it leaves Sunday wide open to do whatever you want. And we don't have to have this wrestling overload, right? We got that Saturday pay-per-view, Sunday day off, right back to Monday Night Raw. And the roster actually likes it as well. They're loving the two-night WrestleMania. They want it to be a regular thing moving forward. And Fightful Select is reporting that a, a lot of the wrestlers, they spoke to over a dozen wrestlers within the company, and those wrestlers spoke favorably of these moves, especially the Saturday pay-per-views, because it gives a lot of the talent... Time to relax on Sunday and watch NFL football. Look at that. WWE's decision to do more Saturday shows during football season was also seen as a positive move, especially with the SmackDown talent. Regarding the September show, says Fightful, it's slated that it will be a UK pay-per-view. Also, WWE is planning to return to Saudi in February and in October. So that is that. I'm loving it. WWE, a little bullshit there with the Labor Day pay-per-view, so we'll see what happens. I'm sure Tony Khan, now that he has this information, is going to maneuver his schedule the way he sees fit. We'll see what happens, but I do think that this is a good move for WWE to start moving their shows to Saturday, and those two big shows in July are going to be a big, a big summer for WWE in 2022. Charlotte Flair reportedly isolated herself from the WWE locker room. Apparently, friends don't recognize her anymore. Becky Lynch is seen as a hero in WWE backstage for sticking up to Charlotte Flair and calling her out on her bullshit. Meanwhile, the latest is Sonya Deville reportedly also wanted to fight Charlotte Flair backstage after SmackDown went off the air after that terrible segment where they swapped the Raw and SmackDown Women's Championships. This is coming from Wade Keller, and I waited on this because I wanted to see who else in the community was going to pick this up. 
and I'm glad I waited. Wade Keller is reporting that he spoke to people in WWE, and I specifically, he says, and I quote, I specifically reached out to people in WWE seeking out Charlotte's side of things because it does. From all from the people that I spoke to, it feels just so one-sided when it comes to this Charlotte Flair, Becky Lynch, Be- Becky Lynch situation. And these people are people I trust. And I talk to them about other things. This isn't like I'm talking to people who are anti-Charlotte. It's just sort of people in WWE I talk to, some wrestlers and others who are just reliable. And the stuff they tell me seems agenda-free. And it's played out as standing the test of time. I don't hear anyone defending Charlotte in this. Somebody, in so many words, said Becky is a hero to the locker room for calling out Charlotte and not letting her get away with what she does. One wrestler I talked to just said that the way, and I'm paraphrasing this to lighten up the language a bit because this wrestler was not thrilled with Charlotte and what she said, the way Charlotte's acting is going to cause issues both with colleagues and with management. He really stressed how respected and well-liked Becky is universally in the locker room, and she is seen as a bit of a hero for all of it. Basically, the idea was Charlotte was being difficult and Becky wasn't going to take it anymore. She wasn't going to have it anymore, and that's what led to the confrontation. Another wrestler at the show put it even more forcefully than that in terms of Charlotte. Charlotte has a reputation flat out for being difficult and constantly concerned that she's not getting the respect that someone of her stature and accomplishment, or at least her character, her character's accomplishment deserves. Maybe there's blending of the two right now that has some people wondering about her. She should be treated at a different level, she thinks, than other stars who were on top or had to work hard to really protect themselves. Steve Austin certainly had that reputation for going... I'm not going to do this. This isn't making me look good. I'm too important. But Charlotte doesn't quite have that clout, but she also isn't conducting herself well. Sounds like it's pretty universal that people look at her as not looking out for anyone but herself in a way that goes beyond normal looking out for yourself in this business and that she doesn't want to sell for anyone. It goes to how she's handled when she's been asked to do jobs. It goes to the Nia Jax situation and how that match turned into a debacle because Charlotte got upset over what was planned for that match, both the content and the finish. That's been an ongoing thing with Charlotte, and Becky is very aware of all of that, and she certainly has the clout to do it. Charlotte, from what I heard, was swearing up and down that dropping the title the way she did was an accident on SmackDown. Her contention is, and I'm connecting some dots here, says Wade Keller. Charlotte's contention is that the tug of war wasn't supposed to go in her favor. And it quickly kind of devolved into what it devolved into. When she flung the belt backwards, she didn't know where to drop it. And she couldn't just move it forward in front of Becky So then it ended up dropping to the side, and because her and the tug of war didn't go as planned, her arm is back there. So she said, why would she move it forward and then drop it to be that in the most disrespectful way and letting it go wherever? So she's trying to make the case for that. To put it mildly, nobody involved in the situation was buying that, and Charlotte was asked to leave the building. Keller continued... Charlotte has really isolated herself from the rest of the locker room. That's not a lot of friendliness as far as interaction goes. She's kind of in her own world now, and she's just not endearing herself to the locker room in any way. It's not like that makes them side against her, but that's a symptom of people of wondering what's going on with her and that she's just in her own head and overreacting to things, and over-scrutinizing things, and questioning everything, and worried that she's not going to be given the protection, and the spotlight, and the being of portrayed as a higher level than everybody else. And others are saying, well, what makes you think you're better than us at that level to that degree? And if you were, it's a very ungracious way, and kind of a paranoid way to go about things. 
The last thing is that Charlotte feels she can get away with it because there's just not enough depth on the roster to punish her right now. Right now, they got networks that want ratings, and they did a draft, and they evenly divided it as if they were not going to punish Charlotte because Fox wanted Charlotte on SmackDown. You're reducing a weak SmackDown roster by punishing her even more, and they just don't think they can afford to do that. This is a situation that they are going to have to manage, and it looks like what happened with Nia Jax, and that wasn't the first thing, and it wasn't the last thing that happened before this, but this situation needs to be addressed, and I know there's people who used to like Charlotte that don't even recognize her anymore. Now, the Sonya Deville story just recently came out of left field, and apparently Sonya wanted to wrestle or fight Charlotte backstage after SmackDown went off the air. PW Insider's reporting that while the Flair and Lynch confrontation happened in full view of Vince McMahon and Bruce Prichard, two different sources are saying that Sonya Deville was very angry with Flair and that she was mad enough to want to fight her backstage at one point. It was said that Deville had an argument with Flair backstage at SmackDown, and PW Insider also noted that there have been several issues with Flair in recent months, including the legitimate issue in the ring with Nia Jax. One WWE source stated to PW Insider, let's be honest, that's what stars do. They make sure their star power remains the same or greater. End quote. Meltzer said that a source said to him in regards to this Charlotte Becky situation, it's a tricky situation, isn't it? Does WWE just hand her over to AEW? And I say that, and Meltzer says that, because Charlotte has family and friends really urging her to try and get out of her WWE contract, which we know is not willingly going to happen. WWE would never do that, which will only anger Charlotte more and will probably swing Charlotte's decision more so towards AEW when the contract is up. WWE is in a very sticky situation. They may be losing one of the top female performers in the world because of what happened here with Becky Lynch. And Charlotte, honestly, at the end of the day, it honestly seems like Charlotte, with everything I just read, it seems like Charlotte is trying to force herself out of WWE. It sounds like Charlotte is intentionally trying to get herself fired. The actions of Charlotte are the actions of a woman that doesn't want to be there anymore. Now, I don't want to sit here for another hour and talk about this. You you guys know exactly where I've been on the Charlotte Flair situation for five years. We all know Charlotte is a greedy bitch. I've heard it firsthand from people that are affiliated with WWE. I've heard it firsthand. I've had people reach into my DMs and tell me about Charlotte and how much she has been disliked for years. We've pinpointed several situations, even on last night's Raw review. Charlotte threw herself into a situation when Becky Lynch got hurt. It should have been Asuka. Charlotte threw herself in a situation to get involved with Ronda Rousey because she was jealous of Becky Lynch. Fast forward, Charlotte was ingrained in that Ronda-Becky feud because she couldn't handle not being in the top program with the biggest feud happening in the entire women's division, in the entire women's revolution. Becky and Ronda made the women's revolution, and Charlotte could not stand that she didn't have a hand in it. Charlotte couldn't stand that Sasha and Bayley were the pretty much beginning of the women's revolution. She had nothing to do with it. She was just there. Charlotte has never had a match that has been even close to what Sasha and Bayley did at TakeOver Brooklyn number one. Charlotte was thrown into the WrestleMania main event because, God forbid, it's Becky versus Ronda. Charlotte just needed to be there. In fact, Charlotte's inclusion to make it a triple threat match made the match worse. 
it made the match worse. Every twist and turn, Charlotte is given a world championship ingrained in a world title program, whether it's for the title or a challenger or a champion. Every time you look at her, she has a championship around her waist or is competing for a championship. I blame that on WWE just as much as I blame Charlotte for being greedy because their handling of the women's division has been god-awful. They put themselves in a position that Charlotte Flair is always going to be in those positions because there's nobody else. Charlotte Flair should have not won the Royal Rumble. Shayna Baszler should have won the Royal Rumble. I heard firsthand that Charlotte did not want to get eliminated by Shayna Baszler, so that goes to her always wanting to be above everybody else and not putting anybody else over her, not helping the division. She won the NXT Championship from Rhea Ripley. I'm still questioning why. Why did she win the NXT Championship from Rhea Ripley? That's not your moment. That's Rhea Ripley's moment. Then she takes the title, goes to NXT, buries the division, and then when she's supposed to drop the title because that always had an expiration date, she didn't even drop it back to Rhea. Io Shirai pinned Rhea, and Charlotte didn't even have her shoulders to the mat at that takeover in your house triple threat match. What good is she? What good is Charlotte Flair? Charlotte Flair has always been about Charlotte Flair. She's never wanted the division or the women's revolution to be better than what it is right now. Only Charlotte Flair. That's it. She wanted Charlotte Flair to be better. She wanted her accolades and her resume to be better while everybody else suffered. Gimme, 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 gimme. And she never gave back and used her star power to put over anybody else ever, ever. Now she said, boo-hoo, cry me a fucking river. It's your fault. It's your fault. Your ego is just as big as your father's. And that's going to be your downfall. I'm not saying that she isn't going to be looked at by Tony Khan or AEW. I'm not saying she's going to be a Tessa Blanchard. But who the fuck wants to work with somebody that is so selfish and greedy? This has been a common theme. But everybody's like, oh, JD's a Charlotte Flair hater. Oh, JD is this, JD is that. Motherfucker, I've been speaking the truth for the last five or six years. You were just too fucking stupid to see that I was right. And believe me, Becky Lynch is not getting away scot-free from this shit either. Becky Lynch is just as greedy as Charlotte Flair. She's just as a bigger bitch than Charlotte Flair. A hero? Who's she a fucking hero to? Charlotte Flair's no, or Becky Lynch is no fucking hero. Are you serious? Yeah, some hero not speaking up about beating Bianca Belair in 26 seconds. You've done nothing but come back after having a child and think you deserve the fucking world after Bianca was WWE's project. Sasha put Bianca over at WrestleMania, gave her the WrestleMania main event in a fantastic main event, gave her the world championship, and then you want to take that away from her and ruin everything that they did for Bianca Belair. Yeah, I'm sure Becky Lynch is for the betterment of the talent and the betterment of the women's division. No, she is not. Becky Lynch is just as bad as Charlotte. Becky is for Becky. Becky will not help anybody get over. Becky cares about Becky. And the women's division is actually worse with Becky Lynch back in it. There's nothing going right here. That women's locker room with the faces of the division are a cancer to the women's revolution. The only ones, and it's been from day one, the only ones. Now, I don't know Becky Lynch, but from what I see, she's a greedy bitch just as bad as Charlotte. The only ones that have ever been for the revolution, the only ones that have been for the betterment of that division have been Sasha and Bailey, and nobody else has even come forth. Asuka, I, I will even say. Asuka, that woman has done everything she has been asked to do. Those three, you haven't found another woman outside of those three. Sasha and Bailey have a longstanding record of caring and wanting to put others over and wanting to make the divisions and championships and storylines matter. They have always done that. Asuka has been great before she got hurt. 
There hasn't been one woman to come out of those three, besides those three, to come up and step forward as leaders of this division. It's always me, 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 me. Gimme, 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 gimme. Charlotte, Becky, everybody else. And with the fucking nastiness and the greediness and the selfishness of both Becky and Charlotte, everybody else is suffering for it because WWE has no choice but to push the top five. It is, it, it, they are to blame just as much as Charlotte and Becky are. WWE does not get behind anybody else for the division to flourish. You may have the next Charlotte Flair. You may you may have the next best thing in women's wrestling right underneath your nose, and you don't even know you have it. Where's Tony Storm? Where's Tegan Knox? Where's Shotzi Blackheart? Where? Where are they? What about Liv Morgan? Where is Liv Morgan? People are crying out for Liv Morgan to be pushed. Where is she? Rematch after rematch after rematch with Carmella. Loss after loss after loss after loss. Sonya Deville wants to fight Charlotte Flair backstage. Listen, all of this story is all over the place. The one thing that I think we all know very well is that Charlotte Flair is a greedy bitch. Becky Lynch is right there next to her. I don't believe for one fucking second that Charlotte Flair wanted to put over Bianca Belair on the previous week's Monday Night Raw so that the swapping of the titles did not need to happen. I don't believe that for a fucking second because she wanted to put over Bianca Belair, but she didn't want to put over Rhea Ripley just a year prior. What's the difference between Bianca Belair and Rhea Ripley? What's the difference between both situations? You want to make a new star? You should want to make a new star. You can't pick and choose who you want to put over. When it's accustomed to you or beneficial to you or when you say so. I don't believe that story for a fucking second. Did she want to go through with the swapping of the titles? No. But that doesn't make her not a greedy bitch. She's probably in that moment looking out for herself just as much as she usually does. She knew it sucked. It shouldn't have happened. It should not have happened, period. Now, Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair are wrestling on Monday night coming this week or the following week. Next week on Monday Night Raw for the Royal Women's Championship. WWE is probably looking at this and thinking, we may have to give the title to Bianca because we don't want to have a problem with Charlotte and Becky at Survivor Series. But the thing is, I wouldn't give the title to Bianca Belair at all. WWE has an opportunity to really make the women's division and a story in the women's division since the glory days of Sasha and Bailey something interesting. You have a gold mine right in front of you. Take this, have both of these women hunker down, bunker down, and do what's best for business. Charlotte and Becky don't like each other. Everything that they don't like about each other, bring it to television. Create a worked shoot program between Charlotte and Becky Lynch. You want interest in women's wrestling after the worst fucking year creatively of women's wrestling in WWE history? That's what you do. Charlotte and Becky worked shoot going into Survivor Series. I'll be here ready and waiting for it to happen. That's what needs to be. I wouldn't take the title of Becky Lynch. You got an ample opportunity to create some intriguing television. Why are you backing away and why are you shying from this when you should be using this to your advantage? That's what I want to know. I don't get why people are so afraid to tell that line. That's exactly what people want to see. They love the drama. They love all the rumor. WWE is really missing the boat if they don't capitalize on this situation. Them putting the title on Bianca is WWE admitting that they don't want to have fun with their women's division. Or pro wrestling in general. But Charlotte Flair, I don't believe the story that she wanted to put over Bianca Belair. That's a bullshit story. I've been telling you exactly how Charlotte Flair has been for the last five or six years. And don't let Becky Lynch get away scot-free. If she wanted to be a hero, she would have had Bianca Belair go out there and beat her on night one. Becky Lynch doesn't need a fucking title to be over. She don't. She's the biggest face in the entire company. You fucking stupid. The same woman that wanted to go heal, right? She's got the power to tell Vince McMahon, yo, yo Vince, I want to go heal. 
Where were you to actually say, ah, this don't work in beating Bianca Belair in 26 seconds? Then I got the geeks telling me, oh, but you wanted to put Shayna Baszler over. Really? Were you there? Were you in that discussion? She was the one carrying child. Vince McMahon opted, nah. Now you're going to go out there and wrestle and you're going to beat Shayna Baszler. Really? That woman has more power than anybody realizes. She don't use it. She doesn't use it. She could have used it then. She didn't. She could have used it here with Bianca. She didn't. She's just as guilty as Charlotte Flair. Becky Lynch is no fucking hero. No hero. Sasha Banks, Bailey, and Asuka, they're the fucking heroes because they are the only ones sticking up for the women's division and the women's revolution of WWE while John Laurinaitis and Bruce Pritchard fucking kill it every single week. Those are your fucking heroes, not Becky Lynch. I'm getting out of here, guys. Thank you very much for all of your support on this Off The Script Extra. I don't know how much I could talk about this, man. This is stuff that I've been talking about for years. But as usual, I don't get my just dues. Everybody looks at me as a fucking lunatic. Nobody will ever admit that I'm right, but it comes with the territory, man. I've been right about Charlotte Flair for five years. I don't plan on being wrong about Charlotte Flair ever. Thank you guys very much for all your support. Hit that thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for all notifications. Continue to join the channel. Become a VIP member in the venue. And I will see you guys tonight live for NXT Halloween Havoc. More Nostradamus from yours truly as we're going to go over exactly why Braun Breaker wins the NXT title tonight. And the old NXT is officially dead. Go Braves. NXT tonight, big night. I'll see you back in the venue right here on OTS. See you guys later.